do know there's no greater name throughout the entire world whereby man shall be saved than the name Jesus Christ. Take us away to your grave. Jesus, 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 are key indicators that God's moving you in a certain direction. So if you're getting ready to manifest the will of God in your life, you can't just sit back, but you've got to go forward. You need to tell your neighbor, drive and go forward. Tell them, say, don't sit there where you are and complain about what you're dealing with. Tell them, say, because God has called me to create. Nobody like that God. Oh, God. Yes, Nobody like him. He's a faithful God. I said he's a faithful God. And I've come to bless his name. Hallelujah. I owe him that much today. Well, the Bible says he prepares a table before you in the presence of your enemy. What I'm trying to say, you've got to keep in the path that God has set before you to get to the place that he's already prepared the table. He says it's like this. He said the steps of a good man are ordered of the Lord. So God is now directing you to the place that he's already prepared the table that's sitting waiting on you. You just got to walk out this plan. Do you assist a senior leader? Do you serve in some form of secondary leadership? Do you desire to put your gifts and talents to use that would make great impact? Have you felt resistance in doing so? Have you felt insecure while trying to execute your gifts? If your answer is yes to any of these questions, then this book is definitely for you. The Joshua Syndrome is filled with a wealth of life-changing nuggets that provides insight, encouragement, and tools to all secondary leaders. In addition to strengthening and empowering secondary leaders, it also serves as an aid to senior leaders in supporting those who work alongside them. The Joshua Syndrome is a quick read with a lasting indentation. Get your copy today of The Joshua Syndrome. Navigating the Rough Terrain of Secondary Leadership by Bishop Dr. Carl D. Kelly. Have your way, Jesus. Have your way, Jesus. Have your way, Jesus. We're crying out to you tonight, God. We're crying out to you tonight, God. Have your way, God. Have your way, God. Ramando Kondabaya. Have your way, Jesus. Have your way, Jesus. Do it in us now. Do it through us, oh God. Move in us, move about us, move around us, oh God. Ramando Rebaya. And we worship you, Jesus. And we glorify your name. And we bless your name, oh God. Oh God. Oh God, Ramando Konde Mandi Aramanda Radadabaye. We worship you, Jesus. We thank you. We honor you. We bless your name. Aramando Kore Besia Yaramaya. And we exalt you, O oh God, for just being who you are. Ramando Kore Meniashaya. We love you, O oh God. We love you, O oh God. Hallelujah. And we praise your name. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah, God. We praise your name. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Oh, God, you're wonderful. Hallelujah. We thank you, Jesus. I love you. I love you. 
I love you, Lord, today. Oh, because you cared for me in such a special way. That's why I praise you. I lift you up and I magnify your name. That's why my heart is filled with praise. Oh, I love you. I love you. I love you, Lord, today. Because you cared for me in such a special way. That's why I praise you. I lift you up and I magnify your name. Hey, that's why my heart is filled with praise. Oh, my heart, my mind, my soul belongs to you. You pay the price for me way back on Calvary. That's why I praise you and I lift you up. And I magnify your name. Hey, that's why my heart is filled with praise. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you. We give you glory. We honor your name. You are a super God. You're a mighty God and we love you now. We honor you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Those of you that are tuning in by way of live stream, <clears throat> we appreciate your presence being with us. Those of you that are here in the house of the Lord, we greet all of you in Jesus' joy. We see Sister Crystal Brown on. We see Sister Geraldine Moore. We see Mother Carolyn Pyatt on. We honor all of you. Those of you that I didn't see names, we thank God for Sister Tamika Hill, it looks like. We honor you. We bless God for those that have tuned in. Those of you that are here, you may be seated in the presence of the Lord. God has been kind to us. Sister Charlika Brown, we greet you in Jesus' joy. We are just grateful to the Lord for the wonderful things that he has done. We are in the, the time, Minister Gloria Brown, where we are celebrating what they call Yom Kippur, or what those of you might know it as, the Day of Atonement. Sister Maria Walker, we honor you, celebrate you. During this time of year, this is a time of repentance. We just came from what we call the Feast of Trumpets. The Feast of Trumpets is the inaugural feast to enter into what they call the New Civil Year. And it also is the inaugural feast to enter into what we call the Times of the Fall Feast. We had Sister Shea Carter and uh, Elder Glover on. We honor you all in Jesus' joy. So as we go through this whole process, what we're doing is we're preparing ourselves to see how God unfolds these things in the Scripture, letting us know that he is soon to return. All of these things that we're looking at and that we're dealing with, they are foreshadows of things to come. Even though they had their historical place in history, they also are prophetic timetables to us. So when you look at all of these different feasts, People say that they're done away with, but that's not necessarily the case. Some of them have been fulfilled, but then there are still yet others that have not been fulfilled. And we're moving into those things, but at the same time, all of them speak to us and reveal to us what Christ is trying to say. We deal with it in times, so we dealt with it in times so as we look at the feast of Passover, it's symbolic of us receiving salvation. It's when Jesus died upon the cross. The days of unleavened bread, us going through the process of sanctification, being purged and cleansed of all of our sin. 
We look at the feast of first fruit as symbolic of us not offering ourselves unto God as a willing vessel that he might use us. The day of, atone, uh, the day of Pentecost is when he fills us with his spirit that we might be empowered to go out and do a work. We look at the feast of trumpets. It's all about now the alarm being sounded, letting us know that he is going to return one day. The day of atonement, letting us know it's a time of repentance. Even though we're saved, we still yet have sinned, and there's a, t a need for um repentance and then you move into the feast of tabernacle which is the time of the great celebration when christ comes back and receive all of us in the new millennial so we're preparing to see these things unfold and we talked about it also in times past we look at it throughout history even though jesus did um mighty works in other times you see them accented in a great degree around the times of the feast you'll see major events throughout the scripture that always popped up during this time and during this season. If somebody has your Bible, I want you to grab Hebrews chapter number nine for me and uh, verse number 22. I want you to make sure that you have a microphone so that you can read it so that those that are online can actually hear it as well and hear it very clearly um, as we're moving forward. We dealt with even coming up to this. If you've noticed the messages that I've been preaching on Sunday mornings, the, the teachings that I've been doing on Tuesday nights, it's been preparing us to cause our hearts to cry out to God. When you listen at the message this past Sunday, the, the message uh, two Sundays before that, we were able to uh, minister. It's all about making sure that our relationship was right with God, making sure our relationship is right with people because it's a time of repentance. Because when we came in to the fall feast with the Feast of Trumpets, the blowing of the shofar, that was the time where we entered into what we call the 10 days of awe. So you'll see the number 10 and the number 5 stand out very, very heavily in this teaching. And we'll talk about that as well. When you look at the number 10 in the Hebrew uh, language, the number 10 in the Hebrew language actually is represented as a sign of God's hand. So God's hand moving towards us. Whenever you look at the number 5, the number 5 is also significant. And the number five is symbolic of the world itself. So what happens is when you look at what took place from the time of Tishri until the Day of Atonement, that was 10 days. And we know that it's a 10 days of off. So we start repenting before this day. So by the time we get to this day, we're at a place to where we're saying, my heart is right. I'm just purging out every other thing that's not right. So that's God's hand moving us into that place of repentance. And then when you look at the number five, because it's five days from the Day of Atonement to the first day of the Day of Trumpets, and that's now God pushing us into a place of repentance, and he's saving us from the world. That means when he comes back to destroy the world, he would have saved us. He would have rescued us. He would have pulled us out or preserved us through that whole process. All of these things are prophetic as God uh, reveals them unto us as we look at them here in Scripture. Um, we dealt with lately talking about um, let's get started. And let's get started. We dealt with 5783 talking about the Hebrew year that we were in. And we talked about how all of these things stand out. Uh, the Hebrew year Rosh Hashanah means basically head of the year. When you look at uh, Rosh meaning head, when you look at year, it's symbolic of what we call Hashanah. So that's what we're dealing with. It's the head of the year. That's what we're in now. We dealt with um, the number 80, talking about paid. The number three, dealing with Gimel, talking about God preserving us, also symbolized by with the camel, also talking about the Holy Spirit. So all of these things God is speaking to us prophetically. He's letting us know, I got you covered. These are some things that you might deal with, but know that you're going to be preserved through the whole process. Now, uh, we're going to deal with something on uh, today, and it's going to be dealing with a little bit about let's get started, because even in this whole piece of starting fresh, we're still yet um, in different feasts. We came from the Feast of Trumpets. Now we're in the Feast of Atonement starting at sundown today. So... We're going to start out by dealing with Hebrews chapter number 9 and verse number 22. Sound the loud one. Hebrews 20, chapter number 9, verse 22 reads, And almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood is no remission. So all things are what? Purged by what? Blood. Blood. And he says without the shedding of blood, there is what? No remission. So what happens is there's no remission of sin if there's not shedding of blood. So when you look at it, it took place in the Old Testament, the priest would turn around and they would offer sacrifices 
unto God. They had to be sacrificed without blemish. They had to be sacrifices that people dealt with. They had to have a relationship with these sacrifices, and they offered them up. And when you look at what happened is that perfect sacrifice we know to be who? Jesus Christ. So everything that we're doing now is not something separate from what the Scripture is saying. It's just we're doing it from the side of having received faith in it. So we're not taking the actual animals and all from We recognize that Jesus Christ typifies those animals. So as we honor these days, we're just receiving the sacrifice. So no longer do we have to go annually, year by year, to get our sins atoned. But Jesus Christ not just atoned our sins, but he washed our sins away once and for all. So these are some things we're dealing with. This repentance can only come by way of the shedding of blood. Read Hebrews 9 and 22 in the ear again because I want them to hear that very good and clear. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood. So blood purges all things according to the law. Go ahead. And without shedding of blood is no remission. So remission of sin cannot come without the shedding of blood. That's why Jesus Christ himself had to die on the cross. That's why his blood had to be shed for us to receive remission from sin. He that knew no sin became sin for us. And he became the perfect sacrifice so that way there will have to be no other sacrifice to atone for our sins. He came and he washed all of our sins away. We're going to look quickly at um, the book of Hebrews as well. That's where I'm probably going to start. I'm probably going to start at Leviticus chapter number 16. I'm going to probably start at Leviticus chapter number 16. I want uh, Elder A.C. says he has the microphone to read in our hearing also. Genesis chapter 22 and verse number 13. Genesis chapter 30, uh, 22 and verse number 13. There's something that you'll see also the Jewish people do on the day of uh, atonement, oftentimes you'll see them beating on their chest. And what that symbolizes is their sadness for the sins that they've committed. They recognize that they've sinned against God, and they're beating on their chest as a sign of saying, Lord, I'm sorry. So if you see a Jewish person on television or you go by uh, a synagogue while you're traveling on your way home or whatever, then if you see them doing this, it's basically a sign saying that, Lord, I repent. I'm sorry for having disappointed. Genesis chapter 22, verse 13. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. All right. Now you see the shofar down here. And you notice that on the Feast of Trumpet, we started out by blowing the shofar. We talked about how they would blow the shofar 25 times in every direction. The reason that they did this was because they were provoking the blessings of God to come into their lives. But well, why is the shofar oftentimes always used during the fall feast? The reason they're usually always used during the fall feast is because the ram himself got caught in the thicket. And God used that ram to be a sacrifice for the son of Abraham. So what happened was God turned around and he preserved us using the ram, you know, horn. So we use the ram horn as a sign. So when we are anointing people, we use the ram horn. In the fall feast, use it to blow. All of it is symbolic because God caught the sacrifice in the thicket using the horn. So when you see these things, all of these things are not just being done um, superficially, but they have a place that represents why we use them. If you've ever seen uh, the sign of the cross, why do Christians wear crosses? Because it typifies what Jesus died on. So we're saying it's close to our heart. We're remembering the sacrifice that he has for us. You'll see sometimes people use fish to symbolize acts of faith. But what did Jesus tell the disciples he called us to be? He says he called us to be fishermen of men. So he says all of these things are speaking to our faith. When you see these things manifest, they usually tie back to something that reminds us why we are who we are. And when you look at all the scriptures, you'll find out that everything that we do, we're just doing it of faith. Somebody said, well, y'all not doing this thing exactly right. You're not doing it perfectly according to the letter. Well, when you look at it, we were not doing that day, so we don't know the culture to the degree that they know it, so we're not going to do it perfectly. But what we're doing is everything we do, we do it as unto God, and we do it in faith. You understand? So everything that we're doing, we're doing it because we trust God, we honor God, and we're trying to move with him as close to what we know as we know. Let me help you. The Bible says we go from faith to faith. We go from glory to glory. So whenever people start 
challenging you and saying, okay, you're doing this and this is under the law. I'll share with you according to the Scripture. There's, there, when the term law is used, L-A-W, it's used multiple times in multiple different ways. When you see the, the term L-A-W, that term L-A-W is plural and it's also singular. So that means when you see law, it can be multiple laws or it can actually mean one law itself. And then you also see the laws of God with a yes on the end. So that lets you know it's talking about more than one set of systems. When you look at the Ten Commandments, that's a law system. That's the, what they call the moral law. The moral law is still yet prevalent. Even though you say, I'm not bound by the Ten Commandments, but you don't steal, right? You don't kill. All of these things are things that we still yet abide by. Um, people say, well, you know, all of these things are done away with the sacrificial law. We don't have to get a lamb and offer it unto God for our sins anymore because Jesus did that. That is passed away. You understand? That those are the kind of laws that passed away, but the ceremonial laws, all of these things are still yet in play. We might not operate in all of them to the degree that they did scripturally, but we do still yet operate into them to some degree. So when somebody said that was under the law, what they're usually talking about is it's under the Old Testament, and they're trying to throw everything under the Old Testament that requires a sacrifice from them because they want everything to be on Jesus. As Jesus' scripture tells us, he says, faith without works is dead. So in order for me to receive the full benefit of what he wants from my life, that means I have to do some things. So if Jesus speaks to me and tells me, says, I want you to be wealthy, guess what he tells us in Deuteronomy chapter 8 and 18? He says, it's him that giveth us power to get wealth. Notice he didn't say he gave us wealth. Did you hear what he said? He gave us power to get it. So that means I can have all the faith in the world to prosper, but if I don't go and get what he already gave me power to get, then nothing's going to happen. Faith without works is God, God's going to give me a job, but you don't go and feel like that application. Faith without works is God has anointed me, but you don't do anything serving anybody. He anoints you for a work, not to talk about how anointed you are. If you're not doing anything, there's no need for the anointing. You understand? It's a, it's a, a friend of mine, y'all probably remember him. Last time, uh, the first and only time we've had him here, he was here in a, a came in with a walker, a prophet Billy Holland. He used to prophesy before he was in that major accident, probably 20-something years ago. He used to prophesy. He said, what good is a prophet if he can't prophesy? He was saying, why do I have a gift if I'm not going to use it? Why do I have an anointing if I'm not going to exercise it? Why is God going to give me anything if I'm not going to function in it? You understand? The whole purpose of us being Christians is not only to know God, but secondarily to do what? Make him known. So why is he going to invest more in me when I'm stopping with just knowing him? There's so many people that would benefit from knowing him like I do. I, I tell people all the time, uh, in some communities, sometimes we find ourselves restricting ourselves from sharing what it is that we know and helping other people because we say, I don't want them to get ahead of me. But you don't realize if I help them, I'm sowing a seed. The Scripture tells us, he says, be not deceived, for God's not mocked whatsoever man. That's silly also. So even if they don't give it back to me and they advance in this area, God will send somebody else to help me to continue advance as well. If I try to hold on to what I have, then I become restricted and stuck right where I... Well, well what if it don't happen in my lifetime? My children will prosper because of my service. You understand? That means... Everything that comes from me will begin to benefit because of my sacrifice. That there's something that you'll, um, you, you'll see leaders that love the people they serve do. They'll pray for their success, not just in natural things, but in spiritual things. Those that are working alongside us in ministry, I pray for them to advance in whatever area that God's called them in. When they're preachers, I pray that God would open great doors, stir up gifts, and use them mightily. Somebody said, well, what if people celebrate them more than you? Don't make a difference. Why? Because what happens is if they honor what it is that God is using me to do in their lives, then their success becomes my success. 
You, you see what I'm going on? When we look at this time that we're in, that's what it's all about. It's all about us purging ourselves of everything that would hinder us from moving forward. And some people have gotten stuck because they have had the wrong look at life. So God is trying to cleanse our focus and help us to see things a little bit differently as we move forward. Am I helping you? Look with me at 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse number 9. 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse number 9. We're dealing with all of these things because God is preparing us for what's to come. When you look at the term atonement, it also means covering. God covers our sin. So when he looks at us, he says guilty but acquitted. The blood covers our sin. They don't see what we've done. They see who sacrificed to wash it away. Am I helping you? Second Peter chapter number 3 verse 9 reads, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So you heard what he said. He's not slack concerning his promises as others would think that he is, but he's wanting us to do what? Repent. That's what he wants us. He wants to get to a place. I, I dealt with the whole term of repent. When you look at the term repent, it basically means return to the high place. What's the highest place in a building? Usually the penthouse, right? Repent means to return. What he's saying is return to the high place. Get back to the place I put you in in the beginning. When you look at Adam and Eve in the Scriptures, what law did they have? Only command God gave them was, don't eat from this tree. So when they wanted an apple, if it was high up in the tree, they didn't say, I need to get a ladder. They didn't climb the tree. They said, come here. And it just fell in the hand. When they went fishing, they didn't have to get a cane. They didn't have to get a net. They just went out there and said, Snap. It jumped out. Why you, you say The scripture tells us, it says that their words was what everything responded to. When they got in sin, then that's when they had to start working and laboring to the sweat of their brow. That's when things became tedious and challenging for them. You understand? Sometimes when we're trying to do things in and of ourselves, out of our flesh rather than out of spirit, it becomes more tedious than it has to be. When we listen to the voice of God, then God helps us to navigate all of the struggle and we get to the place of destination without all of the headache. You know that there's a certain timing for everything that God wants to happen in your life. But when you get in the realm of the Spirit, there's no such thing as time. So that means you can arrive where you should be arriving 20 years from now, right now. You don't have to wait to 20 years from now if you get in that place that he calls us to get into. The Bible says like this, we're sitting in Christ Jesus in heavenly places. Heavenly places simply means I'm in the realm of the Spirit. So now he's navigating me to that place. I'm getting the benefits of what he wants from me later right now. It's him that giveth us power to get well. Have you ever thought about he wants to give you a creative idea that's not for now, but it's for later? And he sets you up, giving you all the connections and why everybody else don't see any value in it, and you put all the pieces together, and then in the fullness of time, when it's time for that thing to manifest, boom. And what seemed like a long time coming turns around and pays off seemingly overnight. I was sharing with them, I met a lady years ago when I was in, um, right out of college, and the lady told me, she said, an old prophet told her, she says the price of gold was going to go high above $900. And I don't think at that time it was not at $900 an ounce at that point. She says it was going to go high above $900. You understand? Now when you look at the price of gold, 20-something years later, you have gold at $1,600 an ounce. And he saw it. Years ago, getting above 900, had I exercised the wisdom that she shared with me concerning that then, I could have been profiting in a great degree right now. I share with you all the time, as a freshman in college, one of the things that they did in the little symposiums they had for us, they told us, invest in the IRA, our freshman year. They said, max it out 
for all four years and try to do it at least one year after your graduation. And they say, if you don't put any more money in there at the age of 65, with the interest that it accrues, you'll have a million dollars sitting in the bank. So that's $6,000 for five years. $6,000, five years in a row, and let it sit. Adding no more money. And in uh, the time when you get 65, which would be about 40-something years later, you would have a million dollars sitting in the bank. All of these things. I said, if I would have listened, God positioned me, put me in the place to hear, and I didn't see the value of it then. Why you say all of that's that's what the scripture does. The scripture turns around and gives us a sneak preview of things to come, letting us know I don't want you to remain in the position that you're in now. I want you to move beyond that. What are you saying, preacher? There's some people that are stuck because of what they've learned prior. And God turns around and gives us a fresh revelation, and we reject the knowledge. He says, my people are destroyed because of the lack of, not because the knowledge was not available, but because they rejected the knowledge. This is, this is what's happening. And God's saying, I'm revealing some things unto you, and I just need you to grab the secrets, grab the nuggets out of this so that way I can bless your life. As we go through this whole teaching with atonement, I believe that nuggets just like this are going to be revealed to us, and you're going to hear God in such a way to where God's going to bless your life. Hebrews chapter 10, we're going to look at verses 11 through 18, and then I'm going to grab it from there, and we're going to deal with Leviticus chapter 16. Hebrews uh, chapter number 10, verses 11 through 18. And every priest standeth daily, ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But this man, after he offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God, from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Wherefore, the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us, for after that he has said before, this is the covenant that I will make with them. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them. And their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Verse 18. Now where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. So when you look at this scripture, he says what the priest did annually on a consistent basis could not do the job. One man, Jesus Christ, came and did the job, and then he gave us a spirit to turn around and move us into what he did the job for. So now we're benefiting from all of this, and he speaks to us and reveals it to us by way of his spirit. That's Hebrews 11, um, uh, 10 verses 11 through 18, so I want you to write those things down. I'm going to give you a list of scriptures quickly so that you can write down and you can do your study because I don't ever want anybody to just take my word for it, but I want you to always study the scripture to show yourself approved unto God. A workman, not, uh, a workman need not be ashamed, rightfully dividing the word of truth. Write down uh, Leviticus chapter 16. I want you to read through in Leviticus chapter 16, that whole chapter. Leviticus chapter 17, that whole chapter. Leviticus chapter 23, you can deal with that whole chapter, but mainly focus on verse 27. Hebrews chapter 9. Verses 11 through 28. Zechariah chapter 12, verse number 10. Revelation chapter 1, verse 7. The whole book of Revelation is good to read. That's the only uh, book that God promised to bless you for reading. Most people stay away from it because they don't like to read about the the horses and all of this kind of stuff, but that, that's the only book that God promised to bless you for reading. And uh, Romans chapter 11, Romans chapter 11, verse number 26. I want you to grab those scriptures because if we run out of time, I want you to have some tools to kind of study because I don't want you to miss the truth of God's word because we didn't have time to um, exegetically go through everything that uh, I really want to deal with on tonight. All right. Look with me at Leviticus chapter number 16. Leviticus chapter 16, and we're going to look at verses um, 7 through 10. Leviticus 16, verses 7 through 10. Are you there? 
And he shall take two goats and present them before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And Aaron shall cast lots upon the two goats, one lot for the Lord and the other for the lot for the scapegoat. And Aaron shall bring the goat upon which the Lord's lot fell and offer him for the sin offering. But the goat on which the lot fell to be the scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord to make an atonement with him and to let him go for a scapegoat into the wilderness. Now, for those of you that really don't understand that whole passage of Scripture, I'm going to try to give you some clarity concerning what took place. Whenever the people would come together annually during the time of atonement, there was come for their sins to be atoned. So they would always have to bring two goats. All of them had to be without blemish, had to be uh, no cares out of place. They had to be the best. And what they would do is they would draw lots from these two um, goats. So they would say, basically, there was a, this one is heads, this one is tails. And they would flip. And if it fell on heads, then that became the Lord's goat. You understand? So that's the one that was going to have to be sacrificed. So they would take both of them to the place where the priests were. And the priest would turn around and cut the throat of the one that was the Lord's. When he cut the throat of that one, then he would turn around and drain the blood. And he would use that blood to atone their sins. They would pour it on the, um, the what do you call it? The, uh, the uh, seat, holy seat, mercy seat inside of the high, inside of the most holy place, inside the tabernacle. And when they would do that, they would turn around and they would take the blood also, put their hands in it, and they would lay their hands on the head of the other goat. And they would transfer the sin from that goat that served as the Lord to the one that was going to serve as the gate goat, scapegoat. And then they would get one of the strongest men in the city to get that goat that served as a gate goat, scapegoat and take him to the edge of the city as far out as he could and release him. And it was symbolic of when that goat goes out, he would get lost out there and not be able to find his way back into the city. And it was symbolic of your sin now going far away from you, not coming back again. You know what the Scripture says? He cast our sin into the sea of forgetfulness. That, that's what he was saying. I'm taking your sin far away from you, and it's not supposed to come back. And there's also been a goat here that died as a sacrifice in your stead. Because the only way sin can be atoned is what? By way of the blood. So one goat had to die, and then one goat had to take the sin upon him and carry it away. So they had to do this annually as a means to atone their sin. Jesus Christ came, and he was the perfect sacrifice, so no longer did we have to do that. We received what he did for us, and we now become the righteousness of God by way of Christ Jesus. You understand? All right. Look with me at Leviticus chapter number 17. Leviticus chapter 17, verse number 11. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that maketh an atonement for your soul. When you look at it, you see in the New Testament and in the Old Testament, it talks about blood was what atoned the sin. Blood was what served as a, a, a point of taking away the sins of mankind. When you look at the Jewish culture, they looked at blood as being something dirty, something evil. So that's why they don't receive this whole thing as Jesus' blood washing away our sin, those that are Orthodox Jews, because they don't look at blood as being clean. clean. They look at blood as being a dirty thing. And Jesus says, his blood washes. So that's why we sing songs like we do in the Christian church, you know, his blood washed me white as snow. We deal with the, I know it was the blood. I know it was the blood. I know it was the blood that saved me. All of these things, we receive it as a cleansing agent. They look at that something that's filthy. All right? Look at Hebrews chapter 23, and we're going to look at verse number um, 27. Hebrews 23 and verse number 27. 
Also on the 10th day of the seventh month, there shall be a day of atonement. It shall be a holy convocation unto you, and you shall afflict your souls and offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. So when they talk about afflict your souls, we know that that's translated now as they were sacrificing in a, what we call a fast. They were putting themselves in a place where they were denying themselves of what their pleasures were, and they're saying, I'm seeking the face of God. If you have the Hebrew calendar, if you can put it up there, because sometimes when we think about we, 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 what we read in the Scriptures, like the seventh month, we think it's actually talking about the month July. But when you look at the Hebrew calendar, the months are a little bit different. Now, we talked about there are two kinds of months. You heard me made mention of this season that we're in now. We're in what we call the season of the uh, beginning of the month, the silver year. But then there's also something called the sacred year. And you'll find that these, these months serve in two different capacities. Now, when you look here um, on the screen, see whether you can see it. When you look, I don't know whether the light is showing up here. Can you see it? Oh, it's, not, it's not showing up on the screen. The screen is too light. Well, when you look at the top of the screen here, to my right, just immediately, you see Nisan. Nisan serves as the first month of the sacred year. So when you look at Nisan and you count from there, you'll find that there's 13 months going around. So it's Nisan being the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and this is where we are now, Tishri the seventh month of the year. So when you read it in the Scripture, it talks about the seventh month. That's where it's talking about the month Tishri. But then also, when you look at the Scriptures, this is also the first month of the silver year. So when you count it around one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Nisan now becomes the eighth month of the year, new beginnings. So you see how these two months that serve as the first month serves as the first month and new beginnings. This month serves as the first month and also the completion, perfection. God strategically set it up just like that. Now, if you look around on this calendar, you'll see how it shows you the different harvests that took place. So you see the barley harvest took place during the time of Nisan. That's the time when you offer first fruit unto the Lord. So during that season, that's when you bring your first offering. And the reason that you do it is because God blessed you with a great harvest here. So you take the first portion of this to say, I'm trusting you to bless the rest of it. Have you ever, anybody ever seen a cornfield? And whenever you plant a cornfield, what usually comes up first? The corn where? Around the outside, right? Usually the corn around the outside comes up first because the sun hits that the best. So what they would do is they would turn around and they would shuck all of that and they would bring that and offer that unto God, believing that God would bless everything else in the middle. And then from that time all the way around until we get to Pentecost, they were believing that God was going to bless them all the way up to here because this was the second feast, Pentecost. Then they would offer a sacrifice here and it would do the same thing. This is where the, the wheat harvest, the figs, the grapes were coming. So they would give God the first fruit of that, and then they would believe that God would bless them all the way around. Then when you did this from that season, you would come all the way to here, and this is the last harvest. This is when they're plowing their fields. That's when they've already collected their dates and all of that kind of stuff, the grapes and the figs, and they're believing that God's getting ready to sustain them all the way back around to Nissan. So what they were doing was they were just operating in faith, saying, God, this harvest that I have, I'm trusting you to allow it to last until I get the next harvest. Well, you see, all it was about was about faith. I'm trusting God. My dependence is in God. My hope is in God. As we live our lives, that's what the Bible tells us to do. It says, the just shall live by. So when you start hearing about wars and rumors of wars, earthquakes in divers locations, all of these storm patterns, you're not supposed to be fearful. The Bible says, look up for your redemption draw of Nigel. The Bible says, these are just the beginning of sorrows, but be of good courage, and I got you covered. So when you start hearing these things, as a believer, you shouldn't panic. You should realize, just like God took care of the children of Israel while they were passing through the wilderness, he's going to take care of you. Just like they didn't have to change their shoes, their clothes, they had everything they needed. When they got thirsty, water came out of a rock. <laughs> you understand? When they got hungry, God calls them to have be manna. And they said, what is this? We want some meat. 
If you want some, we, we were in, in Egypt, we had links, we had some bread. And he turned around, and he caused quail to come down. You want to say, all these things, God gave his provision. And that's all this, this life is. Everything we're doing, we're saying, I'm not putting my dependence in things. I'm not putting my dependence in people. I'm putting my dependence in God. People are God's resource to me. Things are God's resource to me. But God is my source. What do you mean? God will turn around and bless somebody in my life so he can bless me. I'm going to prove it to you, and we're going to dive to the next scripture. When you look at Jesus being born, Jesus was born, and God turns around and have him to be born of a guy um, by the name of Joseph, which wasn't his biological father, but was the guy that raised him, showed him how to craft things. And you remember I, I preached a message more than a carpenter, and I talked about when you look at Joseph, he was probably more than just one that worked with wood. He probably worked with masonry and all of this stuff as well. He also probably worked with metals as well. Well, Jesus was the same way. So with that being the case, that means whatever you have need of, whatever is in your life that's broken or need fixing, he can do it because he's skilled like that. He tells us, he says, when they ask you who I am, you remember that's what Moses says to God when him and God was having a conversation? He said, tell him I am that I am. If you need a carpenter, I'm a carpenter. If you need a masonry, I'm a mason. Whatever you need me to be, that's what I'm, I'm capable of being in your life. So when you look at it from that standpoint, you understand, okay, this is what it's all about. So God turned around and brought him up in this household, brought him through the, the bloodline of this woman that's a virgin. Then he turns around, and as he's going through this, God says, I've got to preserve him and make sure he has everything for his whole life's journey. He turns around, and he says, three wise men from the West, and guess what? They were coming with them. They were bringing all this stuff to them on camels. You remember we talked about last week the camels are coming? All, all of this. He brought all of this stuff with them on camels. They traveled two years to get to where he was. They brought him gold, frankincense, and myrrh, specific things that were going to meet his need at different junctures in his life. God brought to him what he had need of. When you look at even Noah building the ark, I'm going to show you this. When you look at it, Noah was building the ark. When he got everything completed, he didn't have to find anything. Look at the text. The Bible says the animals came to him. He brought two unclean animals, male and female alone of unclean animals, and then seven male and, uh, and female of clean animals, and then you had one more for sacrifice. That's why it was seven. He had three pairs of the clean, and then he had a sacrifice for every clean animal because you couldn't, offer, you couldn't offer a sacrifice for unclean animals. So that's why you only had male and female because they had to continue to produce, reproduce. But you had three reproduction systems for the clean animals and the sacrifice for them to offer when they got off. God is strategically with the, everything they had need of. He never even heard of an ark, but God gives him a vision of what to build without a blueprint. God will give you what you have need of when we move in faith. Am I helping you? That's what this whole piece is about. We're repenting so we can return to that high place, so we can stop looking at life from the standpoint of this is how I'm going to make it. I'm going to make it because greater is he that's within me and than he that's within the world. I'm going to make it because he desires to res uh, reside within me. You, you, as we move into uh, the Feast of Tabernacle, you hear me talk about it then. In times past, people were trying to get to God. God says, I'm tired of y'all trying to get to me. I'm going to come and dwell with you all. So when they were building the tabernacle, it was all about not trying to get to God, but bringing God to them. Then God tells us like this. He says in the New Covenant, I want a tabernacle with man. Not just in the tabernacle itself, but in the tabernacle. That's what the Holy Spirit came to do. So that he wouldn't just tabernacle with us, but he would tabernacle with us. C can you see how it's tying together? Can you see that the Old Testament was just not a whole bunch of stories just to say, oh, that's nice. He was speaking to you and showing you how this thing benefits your life right now. 
and given you insight of how to access him? Have, I'm going to say this and we're moving. Have you ever been in a place where you were getting ready to go into prayer and you know you had done some things that were unpleasing in God's presence and it seemed like it was just so hard to get into God's presence? You know what i The Bible says he's a holy God and he requires for us to be a holy people. Well, how do I get into his presence then? The Bible says, enter into his gates with thanksgiving, into his courts of praise. So when I start thanking him and I start praising him, all of my sins come before me. So what do I get a chance to do? I get a chance to repent. So Siri getting his habit. She's trying to talk to me now. So I, I get a chance to repent. So as I get a chance to repent, then now I can move into a place of worship. So I'm no longer focused on what I did. My focus is all on him. And then now he gets to impart into my life what he wants to impart into my life because I went through the process. Well, think about how they entered into um, the, the tent. They came by the laving breeze, uh, the, the altar, I guess the altar of incense, rather. They had the, the laving, um, the brazen labor where they washed. Then they had the, the altar where they made the sacrifices. They had to go through all these processes in order to get to the place of entering into the presence of God because they were getting rid of those things that would disconnect them from worshiping God. They would say, I got to get to where he is. When you look at the, the brazen, um, um, what do you call it? The brazen altar where they were washing, it was made out of the precious metal and it was sparkling. So when they looked in it, they could see the reflection. They could see what was wrong about them. They could work on it. They made their sacrifices saying, God, this is my sacrifice for sin. All of these things they were doing because they were saying, I'm intentional about getting into your presence. And sometimes we're not intentional. We just want to. We want him just to accept us just like how we are. He said, no, you got all day on your mind. So you're not coming in my presence like that. Get all day off your mind. Stop focusing on the chicken you got on the stove. I got that covered. Get in my presence. Am I helping you? I'm, I'm going to tell you a secret, and then we're going to go grab this last few, these last few scriptures, and we're going to get out of here. One of the things that um, I used to struggle with, especially uh, trying to develop my prayer life, is everything would distract me. I would find myself seeing a piece of paper on the floor, and that would take me out of prayer because I got to, got to start cleaning up the floor now. The phone would ring, so that would distract me because I feel like I got to answer the phone because it rang. You understand? I would see something, so that would distract me. So what had to happen is I started cutting the lights off, start cutting my phone off because that was before I had cell phones and all that kind of stuff, so i just take the phone off the hook so it couldn't ring. And then with the lights off, I couldn't see what was on the floor. I couldn't be distracted by anything else. And the phone wasn't ringing, so that helped me to keep my focus. Then the enemy, what he would try to do is he tried to distract my mind. So as I get into a good flow, I'll say something, and he'll cause me to start meditating on what I said, and I get distracted from a prayer. So he gave me the wisdom of taking a notepad out, and I'll jot down whatever it was, and I'll go back into prayer so that won't be on my mind anymore. I keep my mind focused on him in prayer. And all of these things were just different tools that he gave me over time to keep the enemy from robbing me of my focus. Then even when I was studying the scriptures, what happened is he would cause everything to start running together in my mind when I would read it. So what happened was he gave me the wisdom of starting to read it out loud and don't read the whole passage through. Read three or four verses, stop, and talk it through. So I start who, what, when, where, why, what's happening? Who's talking? Who's talking to who? All of this was giving me wisdom. And then as I go down, I keep doing that until I got to the end. And that robbed the enemy of the ability to take my focus, help me stay connected in what I was doing. And then once I trained myself to stay focused, it was easier. And then when you start training yourself to do a certain thing for a certain amount of time, you don't even have to look at the clock. If you train yourself to pray for an hour... Once you train yourself to pray for an hour, you can close your eyes and pray for an hour. And once an hour comes, the presence of God will start lifting up off of you. And you open up your eyes and you'll say, hours already come. Because you train yourself to do it. You understand? All of these things, it comes with just working in the presence of God. That's what it's all about. I'm operating in faith. I'm engaging God. I'm being intentional about I want more of him and I'm drawing near to him that he might draw near to me. 
All right. Hebrews chapter number 11. Excuse me. Hebrews chapter number 9. And we're going to look at verse number 11. But Christ, being come and high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by this, by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean, sanctifying to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by, by means of death, for redemption of the transgressions that were under the first testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. From where a New Testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. The testator. The testament is of force after men are dead. Otherwise, it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. So Jesus Christ, now in order for him to be the one that gives us the New Testament, he himself had to have died. He talked about ahead of time about the heifer and how they would sprinkle the ashes. That's how they're going to sanctify the grounds in order for the new tabernacle itself to be built that the man of sin himself is going to abominate before Jesus Christ comes back and receives us unto himself. So all of these are different things that you'll see that's going to manifest in um, our time. Look at verse number 18. Whereupon neither the first testament was dedicated without blood. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and of goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both. Uh, what verse was that? And sprinkled both the book and all the people, saying, this is the blood of the testament which God hath enjoined unto you. Moreover, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood uh, is no remission. Now, you all remember when we had uh, Bishop Blue here to do the dedication for the new facility. You remember he talked about how he wanted all the ministers to walk around the place in prayer, and this is what they were doing. They were sprinkling the blood, sanctifying and dedicating all of the articles. They were talking about how the instruments, we need to anoint them and everything that was in the temple for the use of God because these things now become sacred. They're not to be just things that we use just haphazardly, but we're using them specifically for the work of ministry, for the work of the things of God. This is kind of what they were going through. It says, it was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in heaven should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these, for Christ is not entering into holy places made with hands, which is the figures of the truth, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us, nor yet that he should offer himself uh, often as the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with blood of others. For then must he often have sacrificed since the foundations of the world. But now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after it, this the judgment. 
So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin into, uh, unto salvation. So all of this deals with now Jesus Christ being that sacrifice. He's going to sanctify everything in our lives. That blood turns around and atones all of our sins. It makes us useful for him. That same one that went away is going to come back, and he's going to cause us uh, to now benefit from the second death. All of us are going to die once, but the, the second death is going to be um, the one that is going to bring about salvation unto us. You understand? Look with us now at Zechariah chapter number 12. Zechariah chapter 12 and verse number 10. Are you there? Zechariah 12 and verse number 10. And I will pour upon the house of David and upon all the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplications, and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his own son, and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. All of this is talking about the sacrifice, talking about the one that's going to die, the one that's going to serve as the representation of um, the lamb in the Old Testament. Oftentimes, you'll see God not just use it on the side for our redemption, but he also penalizes people when you look at Pharaoh in the Old Testament. What, what son did he take of Pharaoh? He took the firstborn son. All of these things you'll see oftentimes when you deal with the man of sin or what they call the spirit of the Antichrist, and you look at Christ himself, you'll see all of these different things manifest hand in hand. What happens on one side, you'll see a counterfeit on the opposite side. Look at Revelation chapter 1, verse number 7. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him. And they also who uh, pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. Talking about Christ himself returning. Every eye is going to see him. Every knee is going to bow. Everybody's going to confess that he is Lord. All of these things are speaking prophetically concerning the return of Christ. That's why we're repenting in this season. And the last scripture coming from Romans chapter number 11, verse number 26. And so all Israel shall be saved. As it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. All of this is dealing with the whole manifestation of what Jesus is coming to do. He's coming to redeem man from sin. He's coming to be the sacrifice that uh, purges us of all of our unrighteousness, that turns around and makes us uh, the righteousness of God through Christ Jesus. So when others look at us, they'll say, I remember what you used to do, but Jesus turns around and he causes us to now be a new creation, causes us to be a new creature. So they can't label us as who we were. Now we are anew. Uh, when you look at those in the Old Covenant, uh, when I said Old Covenant, I'm talking about in the Scriptures itself, not in this particular day, even dealing with the New Testament. One of the things that you'll find out that was happening, the, the ones that we call Christians, they were actually known as the people of the way, or they were known as believers. You understand? They were first called Christians in a place called Antioch. So all of these things were just people that followed the teachings of Christ. God is saying, that's all I'm looking for you to do. Follow me, because as you follow me, I'm going to lead you into a more excellent place. I'm going to lead you into that place where I can bless your life beyond your wildest imaginations. Let's get started. That's all we're doing. We're starting afresh, putting the old things behind us and pressing towards the mark of the prize of the calling, which is in Christ Jesus. Father, we thank you. We praise you. We glorify you. We honor you now. We pray that even as we come to the culmination of this service on tonight, that you continue to be glorified in our lives. There's so many of us that have been seeking your face up until this time over these last 10 days, repenting and crying out to you that our names might not be blotted out of the book of, of, of life, but we might find ourselves in there, oh God, that this year might not end and seal us in a place of, of whatever we've been doing prior to this, but we might find ourselves in a place of consecration, a place of peace, a place of prosperity, a place of favor, and we honor you right now. 
now. We thank you now, God, for even as we go through this, this 24-hour period of sacrifice where we're denying ourselves of those things that would please our flesh, we pray now that you would bless us beyond our wildest imaginations, that even as we go through this, you'll press into us more faith and drive out of us all doubt and unbelief. We pray, God, that you give us revelation and wisdom and insight as we seek your face even right now. As we cry out unto you those things we've been believing you for that were hindered because we have not sought your face like we should have. We pray even right now breakthroughs would manifest themselves for them right now in Jesus' name. Our family members that have been held in hostage to the hands of the enemy. We pray that his hands be broken off of their lives as we seek your face during this season, oh God. You said in your word, if your people who are called by your name would humble themselves and would pray, would seek your face and would turn from their wicked ways, you said, then would you hear from heaven, forgive our sin and heal the land. So we thank you now for healing manifesting in our land like never before. Even as we pray now, God, for our sins to be healed, God, we pray, God, that the manifestations of sin be healed from our lives now. God, that sickness and the diseases might be driven from our lives in Jesus' name. We understand, God, that healing is the children's bread, so we receive the manna from heaven that you're pouring into our lives right now. We pray that even as we leave this place but not your presence, that your angels will continue to minister to us, that you would favor us beyond our wildest imaginations, that you would cause us to experience, God, greater and more of you, God, in Jesus' name. Help us to get to our destinations and get that rest that we need so we can be by vibrant and effective for tomorrow's assignment. Give us creative ideas and witty inventions, God. Give us insight and the wherewithal to be effective in such a way until we'll know that this is the work of you operating through us and not us ourselves. And we'll praise your name forever, God. We'll glorify you and we'll bless you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. For those of you that are watching by way of live stream, we appreciate you so very much for using uh, this portion of your day to spend with us. We pray that it has been time well invested and not time wasted. We pray that your life has been uh, added, had received some added value to it while you've been hanging out with us. We pray the blessings of the Lord that make you rich and add no sorrow be your portion. If you desire to give, you can give by way of means of those electronic uh, ways up above my head. If you're here at the place, you can give that way. You can give by cash, check, however you so desire to give. Until next time, blessings and favor be your portion. Let the fountains be blessed. Rejoice with the wife of thy youth. Let thy fountains be blessed. Rejoice with the wife of thy youth. Let the fountains be blessed. Rejoice in the wives of thy youth. To you is 